privilege is more about starting at the start line than it is getting a head start. You still have to run a full race. It's that not being privileged actually means you're starting from farther behind the line. Welcome to Let's Play by the Gamers, a podcast hosted by actress Kylie Vernoff. Fans know Kylie best as the fiery Susan Grimshaw in Red Dead Redemption 2 and Miranda Cowan in GTA 5. Our series features some of the most informed and exciting people in the gaming industry today. Kylie and our guests discuss careers, gaming, and so much more. If you like what you hear, be sure to check out the gamers.com website to hear exclusive bonus material from each of our guests. Hey everyone, so I had the great pleasure this week of interviewing the Chief Strategy Officer and co-founder at PopDog, Niles Heron. PopDog is a technology and services company, and they're focused on fixing core problems in the esports and gaming video content industry. Also, one of the subsidiary initiatives flying under the PopDog banner is the Loaded Management Agency, which represents some of the top content creators in the gaming industry, including Ninja, Tim the Tatman, Shroud, and Munition, King Richard, Lyric, and many, many more. And they focus on supporting streamers and gamers as they grow their content, their brands, and careers. I learned so much from talking to Niles, and I can't wait for you to hear it. Niles, thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest today. I'm so excited to get to know you a little better. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. This is this is fun. I don't know if you know, but the the gamers team really credits you for the inspiration for their platform. Uh, they give me far too much credit, but I will take it because I'm trying to do this thing where I don't decline all compliments or nice things said about me it's not exciting. even just just a compliment it really is the truth you know you were you were speaking at this uh future of esports and video gaming conference at goldman sachs and the way you address the audience talking about are we going to have another industry with no diversity and no women spoke to the gamers team in this way that they just looked at each other and knew that there's an underserved community. And and candidly, the the fact that the community is so underserved in diverse segments, whether you're talking about people of color or women or women of color or LGBTQIA plus representation or any of those spaces, the thing that is so powerful and magical about the gaming space is it's in it's implicit inclusivity. Right. It's the it's the fact that there is literally if you know you only need two out of your four limbs. That's that's actually the litmus, <laughs> and and there are lots of accessible devices. Not even to to even you know take down that barrier, right? And right. so the fact that in a space that is so implicitly accessible, granted, there's a economics question because you have to be able to afford the devices, but for that space to still not look like a true representation of either the country we live in or the societies in which we interact and engage and build and plant, like how, how does the harvest not look like the soil? Like it's kind of nuts. Um, and so I just, especially as somebody who thinks a lot about diversity, this is my typically long-winded way of saying I'm, I'm humbled that my words were able to be impactful, but you know, I, I stand at a few intersections in my life in terms of my identity, mm -hmm. but I'm a man every day. Mm -hmm. I am a person of color. I am from a marginalized city. I'm from a black city. I'm uh, a, a high school dropout. I'm a college dropout. I'm a lot of things. Some of those are chosen. Some of those are, are, are given, but I'm a man every day. And that's a position of privilege that I'm able to stand in. So I could stand on stage and say, you know, black people dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's much more powerful I, in my experience to say, where am I privileged and how do I address inequality created from my position of privilege as opposed to complaining is the wrong word because activism from the marginalized is necessary. But 
I can make more of an impact talking about the fact that there are not women represented in the space than I can make an impact talking about the fact that there are not black people represented in the space. Because candidly, the black people in the space or that are not in the space can see me. And that was all the activism they needed in a lot of ways. I can represent for the, the positions in which I am marginalized, but I can speak to the positions in which I am privileged. And so I try to make a real intentional effort to when I am on panels, when I have an opportunity to do so, to, to say very clearly, look, let's have this great discussion, looking forward to it. Let's also take a beat and acknowledge the fact that yet again, we are at an esports conference talking about the future state that we would like to see this industry in, and it does not represent, we are not representative of the future state we should be aspiring towards. It's interesting for me just beginning to dig into this stuff a little. And, I, you know, I saw something on Twitter just yesterday, um, a person saying she she does cosplay and she's been um, really hesitant as a person of color to post some of her favorite cosplay pictures because she gets a lot of hate from the white community if non-white people pose as white characters from their favorite video games. And so she was bravely saying, this is me. And I thought, if you're talking about video games and cosplay, where anyone can be anything and experiment with anything, it's such a shame that we're still dealing with these well, issues. Well, but, but, I mean, there was an uproar when, uh, I can never remember whether it's Chloe or, or Haley got cast as the Little Mermaid. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like, this is not new. The right. representation of black and brown bodies, the the representation and, and slating of women in entertainment, we, and by we, I mean the royal we, and by the royal we, I mean the, the middle America often voting red we, tend to say that our art should reflect our lives, not the lives of someone else not the lives of someone who is less worthy. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's any different when we talk about the reactions, the, the, oh, the, 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 the id sort of like pure selfish reaction that we see from so much of the internet about a lot of things. Right. right. I mean like, and it's honestly not can candidly, it's not that much different from when star Wars fans get mad because something stepped away from Canon Right. Like it's there's this like visceral reaction of like this space means so much to me. You're taking the only thing that I have, which is a thread that I want to pull a few times probably in this discussion, because I think it's so relevant to gaming. Yeah. And I think it's so relevant to how I think gaming can grow when we start to include people as opposed to fighting. But I think that the space, specifically, you know, cosplay, anime conventions, gaming, these sort of subculture spaces, these are the spaces in which it, the participants have found probably the first safety they've ever had. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes. If you love, I'm going to be honest, if you love cosplay conventions, if that's your favorite thing, and listen, I've worked uh, security for a cosplay convention for the last like six years. It's the biggest in the Midwest. It's called Yumacon. My Kung oh, Fu wow. school does security for it. So like I have a pretty deep personal connection at, at this point with, with that world. This is the space where people get to be themselves two or three days for out of the year. It's like Halloween and this, and often this, specific convention falls on halloween so it's like this but you get to go be yourself no one is calling you a freak no one is calling you a nerd no one is saying you're less than you're a weirdo and no one is pushing you to the fringe right when that space when that single space or one of the few spaces in your year that you get to really feel like your true self your your freest self when that starts to get attacked people react very defensively i think that's the the genesis of where people then say, you know, I don't post your, your black cosplay because they feel like their space is getting taken from them. It was the one space they felt represented and all of a sudden it's being taken and someone else is being represented there. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not suggesting that that's a mature response. I think it's a ridiculous response, but understanding the humanity, even in that moment, I think is also going to be necessary for understanding how we integrate people of color, how we integrate women into the space yeah, in a more intentional way, recognizing that someone is going to feel like their space is being taken. Chances are many people didn't know how to talk to women 
were not at didn't feel as socially present the the most hardcore in the in the subculture from which the gaming space kind of grew like you're talking about a space where it was more comfortable to be online than in person mm-hmm. right there's mm-hmm. a little bit of immaturity in that yeah absolutely and, and so th- it's not it shouldn't be surprising to us even if we have to stand against it and work against it it shouldn't be surprising to us that that has turned into a boys club right Right. Not because it's okay. <laughs> Not because it's but okay. Just, but, but because understanding it is how we combat it and how we deconstruct it. Yeah. That's a wild generalization. And there are tremendous, uh, more, more gamers than non- than not in my day to day these days are very well socially, are very like socially adjusted human beings. They just participate in something that was built by a, a bit of a, a socially maladjusted structure. Yeah, I hear from a lot of fans of my video game that um, that they may have started out with social anxiety issues and found that online gaming was a way to learn just sort of societal norms, how how to talk to another person, how to say goodbye to another person, how to have conversations and 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 collaborate on missions and that then they love going to these conventions and meeting some of the people they've met online because it's like they've had this this practice arena, you know? A hundred percent. I think that there was a time, uh I probably said this on, on the panel that uh that that brought us here as well. There there's a time when we thought of gaming as being a very antisocial act. Mm-hmm. Like a deeply, a deeply antisocial act. That it was kids in basements playing violent things fantasizing mm-hmm. about a world that they did not live in that is like you know i think to to most to <laughs> to most of the people that gamers would describe as boomers that is the <laughs> perspective uh that is carried about about games when the truth of it is that in 2020 uh not debating when it shifted but that it has positively shifted at this point gaming is one of the most social things you can possibly do i bought my uh, daughter mario kart a few weeks ago right and it was you know she had something positive had happened i decided i wanted to reward that behavior How so i got her uh, she's 10 she's okay. 10 and um and and we got a mario kart and the first question she asked was you know how do i get online and play. And I was thinking that I was getting this, you know, this game, she can kind of, you know, play on her own. It's, it's a single solo player game. She won't be Roblox and won't be the hyper social interactive. She act, I was actually hoping that I was getting her a, a solo expedition, just, you know, something for her to, to engage in on her own, because I think that that balance actually is, is, is more necessary today than socialization, um, mm-hmm. finding ways to, um, be with yourself. Yeah. And not and not seek the validation and not seek the the constant interaction. Um, so I was like looking for that, and the first question was, uh, you know, how do I get online? And then when she realized that I wasn't probably going to put her online in this game, she kind of lost interest in it. So like I think that this narrative that gaming is this antisocial thing is is nuts at this point. It's actually just boldly incorrect. Yeah. Um, these are these are incredibly social spaces. They're hyper social spaces. There are not human spaces or quote real life spaces you could go to to get more social interaction than you can in a game. Where are you going to go see a hundred people and play against them in Fortnite? Like that's hyper social interaction, even if you're not talking. And then they're talking. Right. Well, let me back up a little bit about sure. that because um, we jumped right into the juicy stuff. But I, I want to I want to talk about you and your journey back to gaming a little bit. And I'm wondering, sure. so you were you started out in gaming. You did many years in gaming, and then you you left about for about 14, a decade. Fourteen to twenty, I uh, was either playing Counter Strike at a very at a relatively high level, or mm-hmm. I was building businesses around that i built a radio station i managed some pro teams or what what we would now call pro teams or they were semi-pro it was about as high as you could get in the time but it certainly is not the level that it is it is risen to today but from like 14 to 20 that that was what i did uh, so you were a tournament. gamer oh i was a gamer i yeah. I saved my money the summer between uh, eighth and ninth, and then ninth and tenth grade. And that summer between ninth and tenth, 
a little bit of help with some birthday money, but I built a, a starter PC. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, like went out and bought the parts and, and really did it. And this is pre YouTube. So I had to like download manuals off the internet to figure out how to plug everything up, but did it, built it. And then, um, thanks to my, you know, my parents, I, I often remember how, um, how difficult economics were in my youth. But I was thinking about this the other day and there was like, you know, uh, I needed a $150 windows key or something like that when I finished building my computer. Cause the one I bought or downloaded didn't work. And my parents had just seen me spend like a thousand dollars, right? I had saved up a thousand dollars and spent it. And they, and they found the 150 and I like, they found the 150 and then I had a computer. Right. And, and yeah. that was, privilege it was privilege that my parents could find 150 yeah you know and just and just do that and i'm really grateful uh for a lot of that stuff um even though i remember you know money being tight being a, a lot of motivation for who i became in terms of entrepreneurship and and really trying to go out and figure out how to make something um lemonade as it were right um yeah yeah i also need to say thank you to the lemon tree and <laughs> And not just cry about the lack of oranges or whatever. Well, so. that's, that's fabulous. I love that they were able to see that this was a passion for you and that you were willing to work hard for it and that yeah. you were accomplishing so much of it on your own and that if they could gift you that little bit to put you where you needed to be, yeah, they were, that's they, what they, we want as parents, right? Like we want to be able to see what is what it is that is bringing out all of your passions and, mm -hmm. and then help, help you when you need it. I mean, but so, so yes, to your to your point though, I spent six years really deep diving gaming and figuring out where I could be passionate and successful and learn and grow within it until I was twenty, and uh, then I took a long time off. Candidly, I was tired of being called every name that referenced blackness negatively in the book on the internet. And mm -hmm. I found it, it was a really toxic space. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, I also was writing poems and doing performance poetry and slamming and, and doing all of this creative stuff. And I come from a, a family of poets and really wanted to go follow in, you know, Big Cuz's footsteps and record music and do that. And so between the two things, it was like this place that had been one of the first safe spaces I ever found kind of gaming. Right. Yeah. And really felt like I could be, I didn't have, I, I didn't have to be beholden to who I was yesterday as a teenager. Cause you know, teenage being a teenager is like reinventing yourself every day and figuring out what fits. Yes. So like the problem is that in, in the quote real world, when you, when you present yourself as something on day one, you don't get to take it back in day two, which is also a very important concept, but yeah. it can be limiting when you're just trying stuff out. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think that gaming was really like the first safe space I found where no one made fun of me for being a nerd and no one made fun of me for being into weird stuff and liking the jazz that my dad had me grow up on instead of Montel Jordan or whatever was happening on the radio. And also just, it was, it was a space where I could really explore who I was without people knowing who I had been yeah. or looking at me and saying, oh, you're fat or, oh, you know, your clothes aren't as nice as mine or any of those things, any of those social pressures that we experience as preteens and teens, just one of the worst collections of humanity kind of like shoved into a school or shoved into a space, just people knowing who knows who they are, everyone who's trying to figure it out and like still struggling for social hierarchy. It's just a bad recipe. Yeah. But um, gaming was a safe space for me. So... And and then it, it turned on you. And exactly. Point, and then, and turned. then at some point, and, and candidly, I think at some point what happens is you realize who you are. Yeah. Right. That's great. It's fine when you don't know who you are in some ways, or at least for me it was. And then when I found out or was able to better stand in my truth, even still not fully knowing at 18 or 19, I realized that, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to have to like explain to people why you, why the N word wasn't a verb on a day, <laughs> on a daily basis yeah. and then be met with, you know, consequence lists 
reaction from people. Like I'm also a kid from Detroit. And at the end of the day, I I started training Kung Fu at this point. Like I was like, listen, I'll slap you in the mouth. I'm going to be honest with you. Like we can have this talk, but there is actual repercussion for being a jerk in life. Yeah. You don't get to just do it and have, and feel no consequences as a result of it. Yeah. I think that that is, you know, I'm a parent and I have a teenager and, you know, when we're talking about social media and, and, and these things that I think is the one thing that I think that we have to be really careful of societally is that, you know, in middle school, right. When everyone tries out being mean, everyone tries out, you know, what does it feel like to say to someone, uh, you're ugly, no one likes you. You can see what happens to someone's face. And I think it's empathy building. I mean, I know for me, you know, I had a lot of bullying going on towards me as a kid. um, And I barely remember that, but I remember the couple of times that I tried it back um, and they stay with me. And I think the problem is that if you can be cruel to someone with no consequences and without even seeing what happens to them as a human, it doesn't build the empathy that we need. Yeah, and I think that that's the the nice end of the spectrum. That's the, you know, I think uh, to borrow the wrong analogy, that's the Martin end of the spectrum. And the Malcolm end of that spectrum is that, like, I'll put my hands on you. Yeah. Not, not yeah. because not because violence is the answer, but because there needs, because we all exist within our social contract. Right. So all of us all yes, the time. And consequences, right? You exactly. might just get popped Maybe in the mouth. Yes. It might happen. And, yes. and, and I'm going to be honest with you. I trust today as an adult, I trust people, whether that pop in the mouth and different people are built different, right? So for some people, it feels like getting punched in the face to see someone's face turn by something they said. Yeah. Some That hurts more than getting yeah. punched, some people. But for some people, you need to get punched in the mouth. I agree. And it's 100%. in different strokes of different folks. And I'm not advocating violence. I'm just suggesting that people learn differently. Right. And because but we of can the... agree that in that <laughs> gaming space with no consequences, people exactly. say whatever they want to say. Because it's not that there is no consequence. It's worse than that. Because consequences in this regard, when we're talking about the social contract, is very reflective of the social fabric. It's reflective of how many women are in a room. The reason men don't walk into every room in the world and call women out of their names to the women's faces is because ultimately those same men want to procreate. They want families. They want girlfriends. They want friends. They want acceptance. And if half of the room hates you, you're not going to get accepted the same way. So you can't just walk in and say anything that comes to your mind, right? You can't. Because there is consequence to it. In a world where it's all men, now we have locker room stuff. And we talked about this a lot, 2016, yeah. right? Election season 2016, there was a lot of talk about locker room talk. But what I, what has happened in gaming, part of the reason I'm so adamant about inclusivity is that if we're going to have a space that I don't think is going anywhere, that we're going to have more and more young people participating in every day, we need that space to represent something near the 50-50 balance and and the the minority, majority, racial and ethnic composition that we actually experience in the world, because this is how kids are becoming socialized. We can't let them socialize themselves in a homogenous white male space. It's not healthy. Right. Yes. And we're wasting one of the most powerful tools of socialization we've ever had in the history of humanity. Like, it's just a loss for everyone to not have true representation. Because, listen, if 50% of the of the chat room hates you after you say this word, that word, after you harass this woman, after any of these things happen, you'll stop doing it. Because... Mm-hmm candidly humans are built to be social we want acceptance we want validation and we want social promotion we want promotion within our social circle but if that social circle doesn't represent the world then what are you building you're like you're building little fascists it's nuts right so when you came back to gaming after you went i i watched some wonderful videos of you i saw work that you were doing in detroit i saw how your passion for empowering communities and and building bridges for people to find their own visions to fruition. Something brought you back to gaming. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, 
what was that? I can hear your passion for gaming and I'm wondering what really excites you about it right now. What made you find your way back? Um, one of my good friends when I was gaming uh, the first time around, and it's not even good friends because we were so close. It was actually good friends because I just had a lot of respect uh, for him. His name is Alexander Garfield. He um, is a pioneer in a lot of ways in gaming. Mm-hmm. A a true, I mean, uh, prodigious actor in in the development and uh, sort of growth of esports over the past ten years. He ran a, a team called Evil Geniuses that also spawned out a, an organization called Good Game, which owned a few different teams and properties. And I mean, the guy's you know Forbes thirty under thirty twice. Like he's just a he's a he had a for any of the boomers listening, he had a the same wallet as Jules from Pulp Fiction, and um, <laughs> and I, I really I really have a, a tremendous amount of respect for him. He's now my partner in, in Pop Dog. I'm his partner in Pop Dog, and I called Alex. I was working with a tech company in Detroit. I, I thought the tech company was kind of interesting. I'm really big on customer validation, so I called somebody who I thought would be a potential customer and just said, "Hey." You know, tell me about what you think about this. And he's like, ah, you know, it's all right. But I'm working on this thing, man. How have you been? We hadn't at that point talked probably in, in, in eight to ten years, candidly. But um, I reached out and we started talking and realized that, you know, we had both kind of like seen very different walks for the for those past ten years. And, and we had very different and I think in a lot of ways complementary perspectives. And we started talking about this idea he had that, you know, gaming – had a, another step of growth to make in mm-hmm. terms of its accessibility, in terms of what was represented there, in terms of it not being such an insular presentation of a, of a very small sector. Mm-hmm. Um, and we started talking about that stuff. And, and I think that, you know, I thought his, his heart was good and I thought his vision was good. And fast forward probably uh, not even three months after that i was working on this project with him this secret project called pop dog and and then we um acquired a management firm called loaded which is uh what what i i now am i I think probably publicly most associated with um and i realized really quickly that you know candidly when we started this i wasn't sure if it was uh, a job or a career I knew it was interesting. Academically, I was interested in it. It was cool to kind of see this other side of gaming and how far gaming had come. But I was still the only black person in any room that I walked in. I was still the, I'm still the, I'm, there are no other black people who work for my company right now. You are kidding me. No, we're, we're at 47 or 48 people. And I'm the only person, I am not the only person of color. There are several people of color. There are several women. Mm -hmm. but I am the only black person. And that's candidly because early stage startup, you hire the best person who has the best experience. Like I, I'm not so idealistic that I will hire someone less capable because of race, ethnicity, gender, anything. Like I am hiring the person who is best suited, closest to network and able to execute period. Right. But that's also just a reflection of the space. It's a reflection of the fact that the people who have 10 years or five years of gaming experience are ten, tend not to be black people at this point. But that became what I realized that I was in a position with Pop Dog and Loaded to do, was Which to say, how do, I, how do I represent, how do I speak with intention, and how do I help the next generation of hires, how do I help the next thing happen in a more inclusive and, re- and, and well-represented way? Okay. Because I am so not a technical person and not a technological person. I was I was reading about Pop Dog and how, you know, it's been credited with changing the landscape of esports and live streaming. And and I was reading about your passion for for inclusivity. And I was wondering if you could explain to someone like me, is this something that you can address technically, like technologically, in terms of bullying and 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 safeguards or is this something that we're talking about just in a broader sense in terms of who we hire and and who is represented um i think it's both and 
right? I was talking with one of uh, one of my colleagues earlier this week, actually, about you know a series we want to do regarding women in gaming and regarding inclusivity. And I think that we could probably point to fifteen things that are barriers, mm-hmm. right? I heard once that it's not not once I've I've heard and have now said a few times that privilege is not privilege is more about starting at the start line than it is getting a head start. You still have to run a full race, right? Uh-huh. Everybody's got to run a hundred meters in a hundred meter dash. Privilege is not that you only have to run 50 meters. It's that not being privileged actually means you're starting from farther behind the line. Yeah. It means you're starting at a 110 back, 120 back, 150 back. And so, but the problem is it's not one thing that pushes you 50 yards back. It's 51 yard things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which makes it so insidious and difficult to combat. So to answer your question, I think that there are a lot of things you can do from the technological place. I think that you can intentionally build algorithms that don't just target volume. I think that a lot of live streaming right now, when you look at Twitch or YouTube or Mixer, and this is no slight against any of them, but I think that a lot of the algorithms that promote new content are based on volume. Mm -hmm. right i don't Mm -hmm. think that we have spent time building qualitative uh the right qualitative measurements for why content is good and what that means is that your ability to promote is and especially historically on a platform like twitch the the way that content is sorted it is sorted by number of viewers and type of game being played. Those are the only real criteria for okay. what content gets sorted to the top, which means that the top stays at the top. It's a, it's a system that benefits the 1%. Now, in a world where we know the 1% is not representative of the community that we want to see, sometimes it takes intentionality to say we're going to take away just sorting viewership or just sorting suggested content by viewer count. Now we're going to say what kind of viewers are in these rooms how much are they participating in chat what's the chat line to viewer ratio now that's not based on race or gender Mm -hmm. that has now that is still colorblind quote you know Mm -hmm. air quotes around the world word colorblind but that is still that is still non-preferential except that it allows a smaller streamer or a smaller content creator who has a very active community to grow more quickly because it'll it'll reward you for how engaged your audience is oh that is fascinating and so now your small community of 50 viewers who are just all there they're in it with you it's really a 50 person discussion with one person leading has an increased likelihood of being discovered by someone or they could go watch tim the tatman who has 52,000 viewers right now, or you could watch the person with 70 viewers, but they have a little fire emoji under their chat. You can see something really interesting is happening there. I think that there are just different ways that we can surface content. So one of the things that PopDog is looking at is discovery very broadly, right? How are we finding content? There's also an insulation problem where Twitch will only show you Twitch content and YouTube will only show you YouTube content and Mixer will only show you Mixer content. And so to watch what is happening in gaming at any given time, you have a minimum of three and more likely more like 15 different tabs open on your browser. And I just think that's nuts. Yeah, that is nuts. Well, well, I, I think that it's what people have become used to, but we also used to be used. We we are, we were also used to taxi cabs. Right. (laughs) I just think I there's still a better like a way. Taxi, Niles. I listen, still like taxi Niles. I still like. I hear you. My hand in the air. <laughs> uh, as a as as a black man, when I go to New York, I'm going to be honest. It's actually much easier for me to get an Uber. Yeah. Right. Yep. Right. Especially yeah. if I'm traveling in the evening. Yeah. It's interesting. Listen, midday financial district, I can get any cab I want. Midday Harlem, I can go anywhere I want. But if I but if I'm late night on you know even Lower East Side, like it doesn't matter. Like I'm, just, it's harder to, for me to get a taxi. Yeah. So Uber is great. And that's, a, and that's an example of how Uber doesn't preferentially treat anybody by color, except yeah. that it has a positive effect for people otherwise marginalized by the nuance of a system. And that's the only reason I bring Uber up. I think Uber is a really played out example, generally speaking, in startup discussions. But I do think it's important to recognize the impact that that has differently to, to each of us. You are still very pro-taxi. 
or not very pro taxi or you uh, you appreciate a taxi however often i don't want to put words in your mouth i appreciate being able to get a ride whenever i need it that yeah. value trumps the the joy of putting my hand in the air and saying, oh, I'm going to walk another block. Oh, I'm tired now. Oh, it just started raining. Any of the things that like an on-demand, like if there's a taxi near me, I can hail one. Like that value is not, is trumped by me knowing that I can just get a ride and get where I need to go. Yeah. Right. And so it yes. just, it changes things. So I think that it's really just about making sure different people are building the algorithms and thinking about different ways to find content. That's a big part of the tech side of what PopDog is trying to do. I I think that that is incredible. And I'm so glad that you explained that for me because it's, you know, I'm new to this. I was never a gamer and um, I had never played a video game at all when I first started working with Rockstar. And um, I, I had no idea what I was, what kind of space I was moving into or what the response would be. You know, I shot, I, I shot performance capture on that thing for four and a half years. It was like five years before the release. Um, so a couple things for me. I didn't realize that, I, I don't know if you know anything about the the Red Dead um, series, but I, I, my character is this middle-aged, bossy woman who is sometimes cranky and who is not hyper-sexualized, but is really given a lot of agency in missions. And uh, my, you know, we're, Susan's pretty good with a shotgun. And when I finally got to start hearing from fans, overwhelmingly people reaching out to me specifically were saying, I am so grateful that you were allowed to be a bit of a nag. I am so grateful that, you know, that, that you have wrinkles. I am so grateful that Susan, uh, you know, gets to do stuff that is badass, slap people around. And, um, I heard from so many older women and mothers who were saying that they're, that they play games all the time as soon as the kids go to sleep and they don't see anyone that looks like them or sounds like them. And um, so that was sort of my my introduction to, to this space and how many people feel like they love it and they spend so much time with it and so much of their money and still feel like they're not seen, you know? It's, I think... Um... A really important story i think that that testimony um is what i will call it and that testimony is really important mm -hmm. because i think so often all right one of the core tenets when when pop dog was thinking about you know how we were approaching market was that we make a lot of noise historically in gaming about donations on streams right we talk about isn't it amazing that there's this whole economy of people just tipping and donating to people and blah 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 and we kind of looked at it and said well wait a second and by we i mean alex garfield like it, it was just one of the things that you know he said that i thought was brilliant has said consistently that i think is brilliant if people are just donating this much money doesn't part of that mean that we haven't figured out what to really sell them Oh, wow. <laughs> right? Like that, because on the other side of that discussion is our esports teams and lots of non publisher gaming entities saying, man, we don't know how, we're trying to figure out how to make money for real. We're, just, we're still trying to figure out how to unlock the revenue. Yeah. And on the other side of it, people are like donating $50, $100 to their favorite streamers for a shout out. Like that's an NPR pledge draft. That means you should be finding better things to sell them. If they can give you $50 and not $5, that means you didn't sell them $45 worth of stuff. Right. To me. Yep. Right. Just the pure capitalism in me. Right. So, but I think that we get so caught up gaming has uh, over the last 10 years has gotten so caught up in how quickly it has grown and been adopted and how much money it has made that we have not paid attention to how much money it has not made. We have yeah. not paid attention to the voices that didn't participate in that meteoric rise or participated, and this is the important part, participated at 10% of what they would have if they had felt represented. Uh -huh. I'm going to buy the game, but I'm not going to go and buy the other stuff. I'm going to buy the game, but I'm not going to show up at the event. Because, like, it's not for me. Like, I go there and I feel uncomfortable. I'm the only black person. I'm the only woman. I'm whatever. And then, you know, there's harassment and all these things. But that, uh, And I, I think all of those cascade from, candidly, people not feeling included and represented in the initial thing. 
Yeah. Right. And so I think it's so important when you tell that story, because I think that it highlights if all it took was a non-traditional representation of a video game player to get people to like touch into a different level of emotion when they played a game, that's a sign of unrealized opportunity to me. So I still even even when I talk about inclusivity, you know, like my pitch is still guys, I'm telling you, there's just more got, people, not even guys. Let me remove gender specific, you know, plural nouns here like, or, or let's look at the opportunity that you have in representing other cultures in these games. Right. Let's look at the opportunities yeah. that you have in representing yes. different voices in these spaces. There are makeup brands looking at gaming, trying to figure out how to get in recognizing that there's an underserved population of women who are not being marketed against in this demo mm -hmm. and also aren't being given a voice mm -hmm. and representation in this demo. How do we increase that? So, I mean, I just think there's a, a tremendous amount of, of opportunity. I'm really glad that you share that story. And I think it's a really important one. Thank you. It was so meaningful to me. And I, I, I really, I really, credit Rockstar for sort of, you know, I felt like uh, our experience there, they really maybe took a risk at letting the women divert from any kind of stereotype that, um, I don't know, at least that I had of what women in gaming might be. Did you get, did you get much pushback? What was the, what's the flip side of that coin? Almost none. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I'll tell you that, uh, do you mean from, from gamers? From the the experience, like if if the if the upside is people telling you that they felt represented, were there people who were on the other side of that coin at any point in the process? So my experience being new to all this, and really my experience in gaming is being in the game, playing it a little to see my work and the work of my colleagues, and being on social media uh, and conventions. Right? I don't game. I was told to expect when I first, you know, got on Twitter as a member of the Red Dead cast that it that would be a very mixed experience. For me, it has been almost exclusively positive. Um, and mostly I hear from, uh, from, you know, from people who love it, who feel like they were represented. I had a woman at a convention tell me that she... Um, had changed uh, her thesis uh, based on the way the women in our game were. Every now and then I'll get things that, like a, just a comment on Twitter where someone will say, the women in this game are irrelevant. So it's rare, but it always surprises yeah. me. It always surprises me because it feels like um, it comes out of nowhere. And, um, and I don't know why it's like what we were talking about, why someone sitting at home on their phone needs to sort of find me to let me know that my character was irrelevant. It's, it's a curious thing. Does that make you want to explore gaming more? Like well, how, how impactful is that in, in, in your new eye experience? Prior, because you're not, you haven't been here long enough to be jaded by that type of stuff. So, yeah, what does that do to how you engage? I will say that it makes me want to hear someone out and listen to them. Um, I always feel like if somebody has a really, you know, look, I. The other times that I'll get a little bit of hate is because I'll I'll have my politics on social media and every now and then someone will come at me with, um, you know, I'm you're trying to take away our guns or, you know, because I've retweeted something and it makes me want to stay engaged because I feel like um, if if someone is taking their time to reach out to me, <laughs> even if they completely disagree with me, they are open to me in a certain way and maybe mm. as a character in this game that they love they might take the time to listen to a different perspective so it doesn't shut me down it, it makes me want to sort of say uh, tell me why you know why or who's your who do you think is the most relevant character or what <laughs> would have made my character more relevant to you and your yeah. you know your gameplay I think that's interesting. I think it's really interesting. Uh, part of the reason I'm asking this question is just that I, I spend so much time thinking about it. Mm -hmm. 
because I think that that is indicative of you having a person like, and I mean like a, there's, you have a, a, a human inside of you that is not rooted in gaming being their safe space. That has found you have found your safe space. You have found your your lane. Um, uh, there is a social psych book I read a long, 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 long time ago called Flow, and Finding Flow. Uh, it's a series, and it's that space where you feel in sync, right? Yeah. Where the where the where who you are matches with what you're doing, matches with how it's perceived, matches with the outcome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that when you have found that places where you don't have it are less jarring because you're just doing something that isn't in that. And that's okay. Or, or what you're doing in this moment, even if it is uncomfortable, your outcome is not tied to who you are doing the thing you're doing in this moment for a specific purpose. There's just, there's a broader context to yeah. your life. And I think that the, the, the worry to me is when those sorts of comments disrupt someone's ability to find that space in gaming. Yes. Yes. Right. When that becomes a hurdle, you're not ready to jump over. Yes. Now, listen, you show up to run the 110 shuttle, you're expecting hurdles. You literally trained for hurdles. You are running over, over hurdles, and it's actually almost the game to jump the hurdle. Right? That's mm -hmm. a different process then I showed up to run the 100 meter dash and all of a sudden a hurdle popped up right right like now I'm going yeah. down and I'm, and I'm gonna have you know like road rash or whatever like there's just I, I think that it's really interesting the way we interface different people at different positions in their lives and with different perspectives interface with the space but I would say stay stay asking those questions and do so very publicly yeah Thank you. Because there's a because there's a young woman somewhere who's going to see that entire interaction and feel safer because you kept talking. Uh, I just got a little bit emotional, and I really uh, I appreciate that. I really appreciate that, and I and I feel it. I I feel what you're saying, and I think that you're right. Right, that's the best thing we can do is stay in the conversation. We can't, not for we can't make people. We can't make people feel accepted, but we can make them not feel alone. Yes, which is its own acceptance. Yeah, there is no community of one. You got to give somebody something to anchor to, and it's the thing that I think about most when I think about how I participate in gaming, which I think was probably ultimately the the plus or minus line of questioning we're on is how do I make sure I'm always giving people an anchor point? How do I make sure that I am always giving people acknowledgement, even without talking to them, that the thing that they were feeling is not crazy. They are not alone in thinking and feeling it. And even if the status quo does not explicitly accept and protect that line of thought, that you can give proof that that line of thought is not going to destroy you. Right, that you are still safe here. Yeah. Reminding yes. people that the same way that trolls, that the eggs on Twitter, that the random people who still to this day, by the way, call me out of my call me out of my name on the internet, the same way that they are free to do that, we are free not to agree with it. And that doesn't mean we have to leave. Mm-hmm. That's and right. it doesn't mean that it needs to be us versus them, even. No, we stay. We hold we our stay. space. We hold our space yeah. and we stay. And, and we, as best we can, mirror Martin, not Malcolm in that moment, yeah. and accept that they are also humans. Yes, yes. Which is the hardest part. Yeah, it Because really I'm, I'm, I'm a lot more Malcolm than Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I don't suffer fools kindly. It's not my not my ministry. But I do try to make sure I see the human in everybody before I react. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing and I am so um inspired um by this conversation myself. I <laughs> 
I really am taking away um, more than I imagined I would. Um, I know that you have this beautiful thing to go to, which is your daughter's science fair. Yeah, yeah, oh. we did a we 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 made a, a lemon battery. Oh, <gasps> that's so a, cool! <laughs> pro, the 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 science project uh, was discuss energy, and we had these like science kits that I had been ordering that we hadn't gotten around gotten around to doing, and one of them was creating uh, a lemon battery and and basically I, I will spare listeners the technical explanation of magnesium ions jumping to copper but it uh, allows you to power a small light or a small buzzer by sticking two pieces of metal into a lemon and it's pretty cool so we did a so that was what she and her her partner did their project on and and i get to go see them present it not too long i'm excited about that uh, not because it is trendy, but it's pretty awesome to be a girl dad. I inher I inherited a, a full a full grown little ten year old not too long ago, and she's <laughs> awesome. And so uh, I they're get to, best. Yeah. I'm yeah. I have one girl. She's fourteen, and she is the best. And she loves science. She just loves it, which I just think is the coolest. I learned so much about science from her, and um, <clears throat> we have a little. She's home sick, so we may be uh, buying lemons on the way home. I'm really. I want to put this to the test, Niall. Listen, um, <laughs> I can. I can uh, send you a link afterwards to how to recreate the experiment. Um, the one thing that I that that I do want to make sure that we we touch on briefly, yes. though, is um, when we talk about in inclusivity. Uh, I, like I'm going to be totally honest and say, and I, I can I can never really figure out how to say this publicly, so I'm going to dance a little bit. So bear with me. Uh, yeah, the truth of it is, the truth of it is that I don't really care about gaming. Okay. I don't like. I think that it's great. Well, I don't really care about video games. Is more specific, is more appropriately stated. Uh, I think they're fun, but I also like documentaries, and I also like Netflix, and I also like basketball, and it's like it's a thing. It's a thing that I like doing. Uh, I do care about people, but when you asked about. Uh, this sort of like history and and uh, background that I have over the last 10 years of really talking about building bridges, not creating wedges. How do you really bring people together and how do you give people access and opportunity? Um, you know, the thing that changed my life, uh, I grew up on the east side of Detroit, uh, kind of, well, if anyone is familiar with the geography of Detroit, it's a huge city. Mm -hmm. Um Ge geographically speaking, not not necessarily in population, um, because everyone has cars, right? So like we just we built wide, not tall. So <laughs> yeah. so Detroit is like 140. Like San Francisco is 49 square miles. Detroit is 140 42. Um, oh wow! Yeah, built oh, for wow. two million people to live flat. Right. And there are like 700,000 people in it. I guess it's like 900 now. So. Anyway, blah, 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 another podcast, another day, we can talk about all the interesting things about Detroit. But the thing that like fundamentally changes my life is that I'm on the downtown, I mean, like just outside of downtown on the east side of Detroit. And all of my friends, you know, I mean, they're 10, 11, 12, 13, they're outside, like they're outside, uh, candidly saw, you know, the first, first pistol, like I was probably 11 at the basketball court or 12 at the basketball court or something like that, kind of in my neighborhood. Um, a lot of stuff happens in those communities that isn't, uh, conducive to future prosperity, we'll say, right? Yeah. Many of the people that I grew up with in that neighborhood, I cannot call them today. I got you. Yeah. Um, for lots of reasons. And I, and I, I keep, you know, I, I still like some of my, my good friends from that era. I still like, I call their mom just to like, see if they're home and somehow they're never home, you know? Um, the thing that changed my outcome, listen, I grew up in a house full of books, bless my parents. They're both journalists. I'm not suggesting that like I didn't have support, but I would have been outside with my friends had I not been inside on, on a computer. Right. And there were lots of people who had two parents who had library cards, who read books, who were outside instead of inside and they're still outside. Um, the thing that changed my life was that I built a computer. I stopped playing on a PlayStation. I started playing on a computer. 
as PlayStations have gotten better, I'm not suggesting that the, it continues to be as much of a divide or a difference, but the thing that changed was when I finished playing Counter-Strike, I could go Google that weird radio station link that someone dropped into the chat of the game during it. And I okay. could explore what that was. And then I could figure out how to go build it. And then I could figure out, and then people were like, oh man, are you getting on like IRC later? And I didn't know what the hell IRC was. And so I Googled it. Like, what is IRC? What are, what are you people talking about? And it's internet relay chat. And I found out there's this whole like professional community of people and like channels. And I went on there and like spent so many hours on IRC in, in the early 2000s just talking to people. But the thing that changed my life was the computer. And it wasn't because I knew I was going to get back into gaming. In my 10 years off from gaming, I worked in biotech. I worked in tech. I worked in, in music and in creative spaces. And every one of those I had a laptop in. Every one of those I had a computer in. And one of my biggest skills was that, like, if you needed something done, chances are I could just I could do it. Because I could go Google it. I could go figure out how to do it. That was the thing that changed my life was a computer was the was access and and more important than access comfort on yeah. a computer that a computer became my go-to that is what video games gave me video games gave me that if i was uncomfortable about anything chances are the answer was on that computer right i don't care if League of Legends is successful, I do not care if Counter-Strike is successful. I will be fine either way. I do care deeply that people continue to feel incredibly comfortable, and specifically people that are, that are historically not the people that feel comfortable doing this, that they feel comfortable solving their problems with technology, because that is the greatest equalizer I think that we have in terms of marginalization. Because they is implicitly colorblind, you can either do it or you can't. I want more people <sighs> in the neighborhoods that I grew up in to have access to computers. And more important than that access, again, is I want them to be comfortable with yeah. technology as a second language. My mother uh, speaks Spanish. And I, you know, she privilege, some amount of privilege and some amount of hard work and some amount of brilliance and mix it together. And now she speaks Spanish. Um, she told me once that, that being fluent in a language means you dream in that language. Mm, yeah. Being proficient in a language means you hear it and translate it into your own language. Oh, fascinating. Mm -hmm. But being fluent means you can dream in Spanish and not have to translate it back to English to understand what was happening. I want kids to dream in computer. I want black kids and brown kids and women, young girls that will one day grow up and be women to, to dream in technology, mm -hmm. to dream in science. Yes. So I think of video games as being one of the greatest pathways and widest doors or, or like widest channels for ships to sail into of like, how do we get these children who are historically excluded from the space to dream in technology. I don't care if they become professional video game players or content creators. I care that they can go get a job in STEM or that their use of STEM amplifies whatever else they want to do in their lives. That's what I care about. So when I, so the reason I'm here, the reason pop dog matters, the reason gaming matters is that the wider I can help gaming grow, the wider we can make this net, the wider we can make the door, the more people can come in and play Fortnite and accidentally learn how to code. Right. Right. That's what matters to me because I, <laughs> yes. if I don't, if I don't hire a single other person of color into my company, you are casting in there. If I can casting generate 10,000 new engineer, t black engineers 10 years from now, that was good enough, by the way. Yes. You know, and, and also I want to hire people of color into my company. But the primary <laughs> mission is like, I am not focused on my generation. One of the things that, you know, waking up one day and realizing you have a stepdaughter, you have a daughter, is like recognizing that this is not about 
us anymore. Like I'm 34, but like it's it's still not even about me. Like I'll be all right. I'll figure it out. I'm a pretty smart guy. People tend to listen to me talk when I talk. It's fine. I'll figure it out. I want new people to figure out how to do this stuff yeah. that wouldn't have otherwise. I don't want to hire Chet 10 years from now. <laughs> Sorry, Chet. <laughs> I mean, listen, no, like, listen, Chet, Chet's going to be all right. I'm going to be honest He's with you. Chet's, Chet, Chet's going to be just fine. He's oh, Chet the third. There's going to be a Chet the fourth. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> be all right. And and you know, I say that tongue in cheek. I I'm we are always at Pop Dog looking for the best talent, period, full stop. But I just I, I that's that's the thing that matters to me. So when we talk about inclusivity, when we have this discussion, what I am excited about are finding new ways. And one of the reasons I'm like your your story matters so much to me. What I want to do is figure out how to get how do I go get fifty thousand girls to really feel safe here so that this space can be for them what it was for me, so that it can save them from being whatever the equivalent for them is of where I could have ended up. Right. If they allow, mar if, if the marginalization that naturally occurs affects them the way it is designed to, right? If that yeah. happens, where do they end up? And that's not to say that they don't live happy lives and it's not to say that everybody, whatever. Like, I'm not trying to judge anybody here, but I just want everyone to have options and freedom. So how do I help 50,000 girls uh, learn how to code? How do I help 50,000 little black boys that look like me not feel like they need to rap or play basketball or play football in order to make it? How do I help that happen? That is the only thing that 10, that 30 years from now, it's the only thing that will have mattered. I'm going to do a bunch of stuff in the next 30 years. Hopefully it'll make me some money. Hopefully my kids will not feel insecure financially. But you know, like, but there's a bigger purpose to it all. There's a bigger there, there has to be. Yeah, there there has to be. So anyway, thank I you. love that, and it actually sort of really leads me into what is um, a question that I've been trying to end all of my interviews with, and I feel like you may have even sort of answered this a couple different ways, but I'm going to ask you anyway, since since what we're talking about here is that. It is a community and we can't do anything in a vacuum and we can't do anything alone. I would love to to have you tell me about a time when someone recognized something in you, Niall, something special in you and gave you an opportunity. Hmm. I have uh, imposter syndrome and survivor's guilt. And that is to say, I never feel like I actually belong in the room that I'm standing in. And I'm always wondering why it's not someone else who didn't make it to that room mm -hmm. that I that I know or that we used to be in the same place or whatever. So I could give you a list of people. Um, I could give you a long list of the people who have recognized something in me when when I couldn't recognize it in myself. But uh Top of mind is a, a guy named David Tesler, who was my partner in Michigan Funders, was the first real business that kind of I quit corporate America to to pursue. He really he saw he saw in me that that I was um, valuable, that he wanted me on his team, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, but it's also. Leon Richardson, who was the CEO of the company I worked for for seven years before I did that, who hired me on my 21st birthday and allowed me to run uh, a biotech operation in San Francisco at 24. It was also um, my high school creative writing teacher, Robin Moten, who, who, who saw that I was, a, I was writing because I was hurt and she thought, that I was great. Oh, thank God for teachers, Niles. Thank God. You know, for good and, teachers. and it, and it was also Nancy Carpalotti, my 10th grade English teacher who my parents were going through a rough divorce and she saw that I wasn't okay and told me that I deserved to be okay. A lot. And, and, and it's also Alex Garfield who, who brought me into this company now. And, And told me, not told me, but gave me an opportunity 
to to get back into gaming in a way that really mattered to me, allowed me to reconnect and, and, and reintegrate with a community that meant so much to me growing up, you know? And yeah. it's all, and, and it's also my fiance who thought that I was great when I was not yet in my mind. Right. And, and it's all, so it's, it's all of the people throughout my life who have looked at me and told me, I understand that it feels like the world is very heavy and I understand that it feels like the, it's all on your shoulders and I understand it feels like you're crumbling under it and you're not able to lift all of it. And let me tell you something, not only are you already great, you're allowed to be happy. Oh, that is beautiful. Right. So I, I it's really tough for me to, to answer that question in a different way than that, because I just, you know, I still remind myself every day that joy is not just something that other people get to. There's a poem I wrote a long time ago. So that it feels like uh, the street that they grew up on had joy hanging low from fruit trees and they could just walk to school happy. Mm-hmm. And and I didn't have trees in my neighborhood, you know, and. <laughs> My my colleague Nick Allen is brilliant. I love him. Uh, he told me the other day. He's like, uh, you know, the best time to plant a tree is ten years ago, <laughs> and the second best time is right now. It's right now, and that meant so much to me when he said it because it returned power to me. Yeah. Well, I think you can count yourself as a tree planter of this gamers platform. I I mean, you know, I'm so glad that people have given you these opportunities and feeling that you are filling up that well and spreading it out to other people and and watching it grow. Uh, I can feel it when I talk to you. And um, and I'm I'm just I'm just really glad that we've had this time. I am too. I am too. Um, thank you to anybody who is who who feels and you or anyone else who feels you know Im- impacted. All I ever ask is that uh, you go you go pay it forward. You go bless somebody. You know? Yes. Yes. Like if you yes. feel full of if you are full of spirit, that is spirit that you could give to someone else in some way. Go through your text messages. Generous. Figure it, figure it, out the last person. Part. The last person who asked you to do something, just do it for them. Just go through your text messages, go through your email, the last request, the last person who said, hey, will you get coffee with me? Hey, will you just do it? Do it and go be a go be a light for them. If if any of this is a light to you, that's all I ever ask. I love that call to action. And I think I might just do it. (laughs) Thank you, Niles. Thank you so much for making time and go get that lemon lighting up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got lemon batteries out here. We're we're true, true green household over here. All right. Well, have fun. Thank you so much. Thank you for the time. All right. Well, if you'd like to learn more about what Niles is up to these days, we invite you to check out his socials at Loaded GG, at Pop Dog, and at Niles Heron. Thank you for listening. Let's Play was brought to you by The Gamers, a community that connects all gamers who identify as women and welcomes people of all genders who support this. Let's Play was co-produced by Kylie Vernoff, Jenny Grossa, and The Gamers team, Laura Deutsch, Rebecca Dixon, Heather Awida, and me, Verna Maloney. Please visit thegamers.com for show notes, to access exclusive bonus material, and to learn more about The Gamers community. And if you liked what you heard, we'd so appreciate it if you subscribed and gave us a five-star review. Thanks again for listening.